So I've been preaching on the house church movement just because I thought, hey, we're moving from a house to a building. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm pretty familiar with. And um, I thought, if you weren't there last week, I preached on three things I liked about the house church movement. And I'm going to touch on three things I don't agree with with the house church movement. And I had three points, but I'll probably only touch on the first one just because it's a bit in depth. And it's like that when you want to cover something, you just sort of start to go into it and then it becomes like its own sermon. So I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, preach on that one today and hopefully it's uh, interesting to you. So the three things that I um, wanted to cover in terms of the things I don't agree with with the house, what's known as the house church movement, is um, they're really big that bishops and deacons should not get paid. You know, that they should work a secular job and their idea is, you know, only if you're a traveling evangelist like Paul or Barnabas, then you can draw a paycheck and, and things like that because, you know, you're not expected to work a job if you're on the move. Um, and I know it, they try and come at it from a noble point of view because, you know, you try to set the example and things like that. But I want to just show you what the Bible teaches today, um, but I don't believe it supports that view at all. The other things I wanted to talk about was the fact that they say you, know, you should always have multiple elders and you should always stay in a house and never rent a building like we are tonight. Um, but I might cover those um, next time we meet. So tonight I am just preaching on bishops and deacons being paid. And I just, you know, I guess I don't always like prefacing my sermons, but then I thought I would just go to... Uh, Philippians 4 because you know I'm not preaching this sermon because the reason why I'm preaching this sermon is because it has to do with the house church movement I'm not preaching this sermon because I'm not content with the giving at church and I think you guys are, are more than generous for the size that we are and I think when we get to a bigger size it'll get to a point where there'll be enough funds for me to quit my job and hopefully that'll mean um, more things we can do as a church so, you know, Paul even says here when he's talking about the Philippian church giving, you know, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So it's not that I'm not happy with the giving that's happening at church. It's not that I'm not happy with my current situation. Um, I do think, for those of you who know my life and know the things that I have to do in terms of juggle this, juggle job, juggle family, um, it does stretch me a bit thin. Um, and I'll touch on that uh, in the sermon, why uh, it's a good idea that um, bishops and, and deacons do not work a secular job so that they can focus on the things of, of God rather than um, having to work a secular job. So let's go to uh, 1 Timothy. Uh, verse 5, I'll start here. Verse 3. Uh, uh. Alright, the Bible says here in verse 3, Honour widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially those for his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she had brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will, re they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith, and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman ha that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially though they who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. And we'll stop there. So, you know, it's interesting because when we think of this passage, 
Um, first of all, I'll just show you here. When we think of verse 8, but if any provide not for his own, especially of those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, whenever we think of that verse, we normally think of husbands and fathers, don't we? We think of a husband, he's not providing for his family. Hey, he's worse than an infidel. He's too lazy to get a job, you know, get his butt off the couch um, and work a job. Or we think like, you know, you know, father providing for his children, making sure his children are taken care of. But when we look at the context of this passage, does it only apply to fathers? Actually, the context is the church, isn't it? It's about widows. It's about if, if, um, if widows have children, hey, make sure that you, if, you, if you have a mom that, you know, where your dad is dead, children, you have a responsibility to take care of your parents. And it says here that, hey, even if they um, know people, you know, hey, if you can relieve a widow, so that the church not be charged, hey, that's a responsibility you have too. And even later on, it goes on to say, hey, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So, you know, I know maybe it sounds bad coming from me, but hey, this is what the Bible says, right? It says, if any provide not for his own house, uh, his own, especially of those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So it doesn't just apply to husbands and fathers. Wouldn't this only always, wouldn't this also apply to children that aren't taking care of their parents? It would also apply to a church that doesn't take care of widows. And if we go on to see what it actually is talking about, it goes on to say a church that doesn't provide for the elders that rule well, isn't the Bible saying, hey, that they're worse than an infidel as well? If, if a church will not get the funds together to actually provide for the elders that rule well and labor in word and in doctrine. So I don't think this only applies to husband and fathers. I think in the context, it just applies to you have a responsibility to provide for your house at home. You have, a, you have a responsibility to provide for, for this house. And it's not just me, it's just people that need help. People that need help, widows, widows indeed. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's not just an application to a husband or a father. Now, one of the objections somebody might have to this, uh, to this passage, I think, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, you know, to me, 1 Timothy 5, it, it sort of like ends the argument that elders should, should be able to get paid. Because, you know, obviously, it's talking about widows, taking care of widows, and then it talks about the elders. But then somebody might say, you know, they'll just look at verse 17 and 18 and they'll say, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word of doctrine. And they might say, well, this is not talking about actually paying them or providing for their needs. It's just telling them that you need to give them respect, like double respect. Um, but it you know, we read this passage together. You think it's just talking about respect? It's talking about honoring widows that are widows indeed. You're not just honoring a widow and then she's need, she needs things. And you, you know, like the Bible says in James, you know, you say, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding, give them not those things that are needful to the body. What are the profit? And it's the same. What does honor a profit if you don't actually provide for the things that they need? So to me, if somebody's going to say, hey, the honor is just respect and it's not actually a financial responsibility, I mean, are they ignoring the whole first half of the chapter, which is talking about providing financially for widows, and then it just tacks on there the fact that elders also should receive honor, and in fact, double honor. So, you know, does that mean that they should get paid twice as much as a widow? I don't know, but um, possibly, right? If it's saying double. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's just a command to give them respect, because obviously it's talking about uh, providing financially. But I just wanted to show you here that the Bible is very clear that honor is financial, a financial responsibility. Um, look at what it says here in Matthew 15. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. So he's referring to um, one of the Ten Commandments, to honor your mother and father. And people will think, well, hey, it's to respect your mother and father, right? Well, let's uh, read on. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, 
teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. So I just want to go back to verse 5. It says here, But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honour not his father and his mother. So what is Jesus teaching here? See, the honour is not just respect. Because somebody say, Oh yeah, I do honour my mother and my father, but anything I give my mother and father, oh, it's a gift. It's something that I'm you know, giving to them, as opposed to something that you are commanded and you are responsible for. Like you, you actually owe your parents um, honour in the sense when they require, uh, when, when they need to be looked after, we as their children have a responsibility to take care of them. It's not a gift, it's not something additional that we're giving to them. We, we are giving back to them what is due to them as our parents. So that's what he's condemning because he's saying here people are giving to their mother and father and thinking that it's a gift, that it's like something on top of what they actually owe their mother and father. But he's saying here, you, you say, it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honour not his father and his mother. So you see here that the honour is more than just respect. And that's why when the Bible talks about it in 1 Timothy 5, when you honour widows and an elder that rules well should receive double honour, it's not just talking about respect. It's talking about a financial responsibility from um, the people. All right, let's go... <clears throat> just back to 1 Timothy 5, and we just look at that passage in verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. So I think it's very clear here, it, it's, it's likening that Old Testament passage to say, You don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And then it quotes another passage, The labourer is worthy of his reward. Now, this passage is not actually quoted in the Old Testament, it's actually a New Testament passage in the Gospels. And let's just see what it says there. So we'll go to um, Luke 10 1. After these things, it says here, The Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labourers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labourers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way, and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. And look at this. For the labourer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So this is not saying that you don't go from house to house to preach the gospel. This is saying this is a miracle that Jesus performed with these 70 apostles that he would send them out with no provision whatsoever, you know, just the shoes on their feet and I think one staff, I'm pretty sure, when you compare it to the other passages. Because you will notice that it says don't bring any staves because it's about carrying additional provision, right? Don't carry these things with you. So you just go um, basically with your clothes and shoes and things like that. But it says here, the labourer is worthy of his hire. So in 1 Timothy 5, it talks about the labourer is, is worthy of his reward, and it's quoting this passage for the labourer is worthy of his hire. Now there's another passage in Matthew 10, where the 12 disciples were sent out, and um, <clears throat> it says the workman is worthy of his meat. Um, but the point I just want to make here is, you know, obviously the, the, the direct application of this passage is, hey, you know, the 12 apostles are being sent out, and then the 70 apostles are being sent out. But then we would base the doctrine on 1 Timothy 5, because 1 Timothy 5 is talking about the elders in the church, and then it's quoting back to say, hey, yeah, you know, Jesus performed this miracle where he sent them out and didn't have any provision and they didn't need to feel bad about receiving things from people because he says the labourer is worthy of his reward. The labourer is worthy of his hire. The 70 didn't have to feel bad that they were going and, you know, having somebody's hospitality they were being taken care of because the labourer is worthy of his hire. Um, and like they did not have to feel bad about it, bishops in the New Testament don't need to feel bad about it either because it's something that they have the authority to do. So, you know, it's funny, if you run a charity or something like that, and you're asking people for money, you might feel like, you know, you're begging um, for, um, you know, people to provide for you. 
But, you know, it's really great that, you know, we have the Word of God, especially for me, because it's not my opinion. You know, I can just tell you what the Word of God says, and it's not me telling, hey, you need to pay me. But the Bible says here, hey, you know, I have authority to, to be paid. I don't have to feel bad about it. Um, and, that's, and that's good for a bishop, you know, because you, you guys obviously uh, are not in that situation, so you don't have to, you know, deal with that. But obviously, uh, bishops do, and that's why this thing is very important to obviously people that are in that position. Um, now, somebody might say, according to this passage, they'll say, yeah, but look at what they're giving them. They're giving them, you know, in the passage, the other passages, the laborer is worthy of his meat. And somebody might say, but they're just giving them food. They're not actually paying them a salary. They're just, you know, you know feeding them and things like that. They're, they're not giving them possessions. They're not giving them anything else. It's just food. My thought to that is, well, if it's just food, why then is it quoted reward and hire? You know, there's meat, obviously, because meat is one type of reward and hire, but then the other passages quote reward and hire. But, you know, to think about this, right? The, the, the apostles and the, the other 70 apostles, they've gone out, they've got nothing, right? Because they, they, they haven't brought a purse, they haven't brought a script, they don't have gold, they don't have silver, they haven't brought two coats, they haven't brought two state. They just, it's like if I just went soul winning now and I just like, didn't have anything, right? I just went out. Don't, don't you think, you know, if, if, I, if I went and somebody was going to provide for me supernaturally, don't you think that they would give them some other things? I mean, just, just naturally reasoning. Like, you know, if, if you were back in those days and you had some apostles come and they're healing the sick in your house and doing all these things, I, you'd probably say, hey, like, let me give you another coat. Like, you know, your shoes look worn down. Let's change your shoes. Let's, you know, let's do things like that. I mean, surely they're not just, you know, they see this ragged person, you know, their staff's half broken, their coat's got all holes to it, but they're just going to give them food. You know, like, am I expect to believe that, that that's the situation, that they gave them nothing but food? But that's not even the truth, I think, because they didn't just give them food, right? What else would they have to give them? If they're staying in their house. Shelter, right? So they're not just feeding them, because they need somewhere to live. They need a bed. They need a shower. They need, well, maybe they didn't have showers back then. They need a basin of, you know, a keg of water or something to wash themselves, you know, they had shelter, you know, lighting, whatever, you know, so they would have had other things. So let's say it's just food, right? So you're telling me they can feed them, but it, it, let's say like I can feed you at my house, but if I gave you like some dried um, preserves, like some dried apples or something to take on your journey, that, is that okay? Because that's still food, right? But it's not, it's, not, it's not something you're eating now, but you're going to take it with you to eat later. Is that okay? So if, I, if it's okay to give somebody dried fruit to eat later, why can't I give them gold and silver so they can buy food later? I mean, I mean really, are we going to be that pharisaical about it? That like, it must be food, it must be eaten at the house, otherwise you can't do that? It's like, really, what's the difference? You know, if I gave somebody preserved fruit to take with them on their journey, some dried bread to eat later, you know, why don't I just give them gold and silver? That's not going to corrupt. And then they can go, when they go to the next town, they can use the gold and silver and buy whatever they want. Um, yeah, so to me, yeah, yeah, the, you know, so there's also a place to live. Um, so, so, so think about this. So you can, so somebody can sleep in your home, but you can't rent a place for them to sleep somewhere else. You know what I mean? Like, where, where are they going to draw the line? So it's like, okay, they provided them a place to sleep, but yeah, but it's only if like you have them in your house in a room. But you can't pay money. Like, if you only have a one-bedroom house and a missionary comes through, or you have a bishop and they don't have a place to stay you can't put money together and put them up in a place, you know? Or, you know, like I said, like, you can't give them gold and silver so they can source their own place. Do you know what I mean? Like, so you see how it's, it's all the same thing, really. Like, if you, if you can provide them with food, you can provide them with things, what does it matter in what means you provide it? You know, whether you provide it for them directly, whether you pay for something for them to provide, or you give them the money so that they can go and find it themselves. It's all the same thing. You know, there's no difference. Um, so I already covered, you know, is it not reasonable to think that people would have offered them other things in addition to food and shelter? You know, the apostles, you know, it, it was supernatural that they were provided for, but they weren't like the Israelites in the wilderness where their shoes just never waxed old and they were just walking through the wilderness. So things would have started to run down on their travels and maybe people would have um, provided for them. Um, let's see what else there is. Uh, 
that's all I wanted to say there. The other stuff I'll, I'll just leave. I, I, had a, I had a point here to say that, um, <clears throat> you know, money is just a system of barter. You know, people think, oh, you know, you can give somebody food and you can give them possessions, but you can't give them money. It's not talking about money, it's just talking about things. And you, you kind of think, come on, guys, money is just another thing. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, instead of giving people pieces of meat, you give them pieces of a metal so that they can trade that metal for the meat. That's all money is. Money is just a system of barter. It's not like it's a different category to commodities. It's, the reason why it's used as money is, is it's a commodity that doesn't corrode. So you can take it with you and it has the same value somewhere else. And that's why gold and silver becomes money. Now, when we think of money, we think of currency. We think of what governments issue. But what governments issue currency is not really money because the only reason why the plastic in your wallet has any value is because of government decree. You know, because that plastic itself is not worth $100. You know, it's worth $100 because a government bureaucrat somewhere said, that's worth $100. And the reason why you can use it to buy something worth $100 is because the person receiving your money also believes the government decree to say, ah, oh, this is worth $100, so I'm willing to take that. But this is why currencies eventually collapse, because they keep printing money, and then people start to realize, wait a second, this money's not actually worth 100 you know, the equivalent of gold or silver, and I don't want your, your useless plastic, and then you get situations like Zimbabwe, where it's like cheaper to wipe your bum with the currency than it is to actually use it to buy things. And then they need to buy a loaf of bread, you need a wheelbarrow of currency, because it's not actually worth anything. Whereas real money is, comes about because people need a system of barter, and gold and silver is naturally what is used because it can be divided, it can be made into little pieces, it's rare, so you know, if you, don't, if you wanna you know, carry $100,000 with you, you're not like herding all these cattle with you all the time, you, you're bringing like a little pouch full of gold coins and that's $10,000 or $100,000 and it doesn't wax old. So you know, 20 years later, you're still gonna have 20 pieces of gold. You're not gonna have 10 pieces of gold because 20 of them have, have corroded and are no longer around, like if you use something else for money. So there's a difference between currency and money, but when we think of money, we think of currency just as our local everyday colloquial. But it's good to know the difference. <clears throat> I don't want to go on too many rabbit trails. Um, all right, let's look at 1 Corinthians 9 um, and what Paul has written here. It says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this, have we not power to eat and to drink? Now power is the same word as authority. Um, so when you see that word power, it's not like he's just got the ability to eat and drink, it's the authority to be uh, fed. Have we not power to lead about a sister or wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have, we, have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? And look, he quotes the same passage. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, that is written. This is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and he that thresheth, thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So Paul's saying here, if, if we sow all these spiritual things to you, is it really that big of a deal that you, know, you provide for the needs of the elders of the church? <clears throat> if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying uh, void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach, 
the gospel I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, I'll, I'll touch on what those passages mean in a second. But even after reading this, I mean, are you getting the idea that, because a lot of people will use Paul as an example and say, you know, Paul didn't take a paycheck, so why should a bishop get a paycheck? But then it doesn't even make sense because Paul wasn't a bishop. So why are, we, why, are we using, why are they using Paul as an example of somebody not getting paid and as, and as an example to bishops when Paul was not a bishop? Do you know what I mean? And if, if they say, well, one thing they'll say is, well, you know, they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel, as we read in that passage. They'll say, well, that's just for the traveling evangelist. That's not for the bishop that's actually settled here and, and he's preaching and he's able to get a job, whereas a traveling evangelist isn't able to. Well, we already covered that in 1 Timothy 5, you know, because, I mean, that would be the basis for an elder to get paid. And elders are not necessarily traveling evangelists like um, Paul. But even so, I mean, Paul is even saying in this passage where they try to use Paul as an example of bishops not getting paid. I mean, Paul is even saying he has the power to forbear working. I mean, he has the authority to, to get money from the churches that he's ministering to. So I don't even know how Paul is being used as an example to not get paid when he's saying, you know, I, I have, we have the power to forbear working if we wanted to. Um, so... <coughs> Uh, in verse, uh, yeah, so that was uh, verse 4 to 6. He, he does say that they have the power to forbear working, as did the other apostles. Now, if we go back, if, we, if we're in First Timothy 5, we can see that the elders were well accounted worthy of double honour. And I just wanted to show you these passages real quick, because um, I want to show you here that a bishop is an elder. I don't, I don't know if a, a deacon is an elder, you know, I wouldn't say that a deacon is an elder, but I do believe a bishop is an elder. I don't believe elder and bishops are different offices like some churches have. They have a deacon, they have bishops, and then they have elders. Um, to me, that's just, a, you know, created, a created office that's not actually ex uh, uh, described in the Word of God. But um, let me go to Titus 1. I'll show you here why I believe a bishop and an elder is the same thing. And, and really, there's no reason for me to believe that an elder is anything other than a bishop um, because when it says it calls the elders of the church together I mean if they're all the bishops then that makes sense um, and there's no other office described you know when it talks about the offices in 1st Timothy 3 and Titus 1 it talks about honoring in 1st Timothy 4 I mean it only talks about three types of paid positions doesn't it? it talks about widows that are taken in and they have to be over 60 and they have to fulfill some requirement and then you have bishops and deacons that fulfill an office and that's why I believe they're the only things that are paid because widows get taken in and then you hold these positions and then these are positions in the church that um, warrant, I believe, uh, payment. <clears throat> so in Titus 1, he says here to uh, uh, Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and look at this, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So the job that he left for Titus in Crete was to ordain elders in every city. And then when it goes on into verse 6 and verse 7, if any be blameless, the husband and one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, and so on and so forth. So it's, see, it, it's clear here that if he's, if he's giving the, the charge to Titus, say, hey, ordain elders in every city, and he's saying, a bishop must be blameless. Obviously, he's ordaining bishops, and bishops are elders. They're one and the same thing, right? Now, the reason why I don't believe a deacon is an elder is because, in, I don't know if you realize this, but in Titus 1, it only talks about the qualifications of a bishop. In 1 Timothy 3, it talks about the qualifications of a bishop and a deacon, and it doesn't refer to them as elders. So this is why I take the position that only bishops are elders and deacons are not elders. Um, they're just paid servants in the church, even though they need to fulfill the same spiritual requirements as bishops do. Um, I want to show you here as well, Peter 5, that the apostle Peter was a bishop. He was an elder. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Second John. The Apostle John was a bishop. 
the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. So if you remember back in 1 Corinthians 9, where is that? He's saying here, is it only me and Barnabas that have the power to forbear working? No, the, all the apostles do as well. So they were paid as well, and they were bishops. So if you're making the case from 1 Corinthians 9 that bishops should not get paid, I mean, this passage is showing Paul that Paul is actually for elders getting paid because he, he, only him and Barnabas are the ones that are forbearing working in this instance. He's saying everybody else is married, everybody else has the power to eat and drink. You know, the, the apostles are, um, let's see, and the other apostles, as well as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, now, Cephas is Peter. Peter was an elder. He was a bishop. And he has the authority to forbear working. Um, now, let's go to um, further down. I wanted to address this point because I think a lot of people, I think, have a misunderstanding of what Paul is teaching in this passage because a lot of people will say, well, Paul never took a paycheck. You know, he only ever worked his way. And, and, you know, like, even though he could, right, but he never, he never used that power because of what was written in this passage. And, um, you know, he made tents and he always worked, like in First Thessalonians, he worked. Um, and, and that was what he was boasting about. You know, like his boat, not saying it was a bad type of boasting, but his boasting was, hey, you know, yeah, people can get paid, but then I didn't have to take a paycheck. I always worked my way. And as though that is something that is more honorable than somebody that gets paid by a church. I don't believe that's what this is teaching, and I'll explain why. But the reason why they take that position, because later on, he says here, somebody's calling me, I don't know who that is there. I'm just worried, actually, it's the, um, the pizza guy. Can tell, um, uh, Ashton, yeah, or Alex, one of you guys, can you just call that number? Just, just write down your phone, because I need my phone for my notes. <laughs> If he's, he might be out the front. If he, if he does come in, just chuck it on the tables. Uh, yep, <clears throat> don't want to hold up the pizzas. But you're going to have to wait until I finish preaching. <laughs> so, um, okay, so 2 Corinthians, yeah, so where was I? So I don't think this is what this is teaching, but the reason why people think that's what it's teaching, is because um, of these passages here. So he goes on about, like, they that minister about holy things live of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers of the temple. So I don't believe that bishops are the New Testament priests, but he's just using that analogy and saying, in the Old Testament, the Levites and the priests, they ministered about the temple, they lived of the things of the temple. Same in the New Testament... You know, those that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Not, he's not saying that bishops are priests, right? Because we, it's a priesthood of the believer. But he's just saying, hey, they lived off the things of God. Hey, bishops and, um, and, and deacons and widows in the New Testament, they live of the things of God too. But he says here, but I have used none of these things. Neither have I written that these things should be done unto me. And then later on he says here, um, uh, where did it go? He talks about what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, I'll try to explain what I believe these are talking about, but I don't believe what Paul is teaching here is saying he never took a paycheck from a church. You know, he always worked his way, um, you know, and he, he never, ever used this power at all. And I'll, I'll explain why. We'll go to 2 Corinthians 8. 23. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Corinthian letters, you know, in 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of rebuke, right? It's saying, like, it's correcting them on all these things, giving them tips and all this stuff. That's why Corinthians is a really great book, because there's a lot of practical uh, tips on how to run a church and how things should be run in the church. And it's like in 2 Corinthians, you know, there are some other things going on, like there's people are still questioning his apostleship, but later on you can see that the Corinthian church did repent of the fornication, did repent of the sin that was happening within the church. And he commends them. And, he, and it's almost like the, the attitude that Paul is writing in, in the Second Corinthians letter, it, it's, it's different. He's like so glad that they, that they did the right thing and now they're on the right track. And even to the point where their zeal is, is provoking many to do greater things. Um, 
But look at what it says here in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 8. <coughs> it says, Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner. Now remember, Titus was ordained as a bishop, right? Because Paul is saying, I want you to do what I've done to you. So Titus was a bishop, right? He wasn't just a traveling evangelist necessarily. Um, he was a bishop. He was the bishop in Crete, and he was ordaining other bishops. He is my partner and fellow helper concerning you of our brethren, uh, or our brethren being quiet of, uh, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So he's saying here that they want, he wants the Corinthian church to take care of Titus, who has now come to be a bishop in the church in Corinth. Because he goes on in 2 Corinthians 9 talking about the ministering to the saints. And this is why I think the, the proof of your love that he's referring to in verse 24 is saying, hey, he's going to come. You say that you love, you say that you, you, you love Titus. Now you've got to prove it because you're actually going to provide for this man. Um, chapter 9. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Archaea was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. See, he's commending um, the Corinthian church now for their giving. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up before your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So what Paul is talking about here, he's, he's like, it's like he's, he's built up the Corinthians, you know, he's told other people, saying, man, the Corinthians are so loving, they're so, they're so charitable, they're so generous. And he's saying, like, I just want to let you know because I'm sending people there and I don't want my boasting to be in vain. So when you actually receive Titus, you know, make sure, you know, you actually, you know, you know, don't make my, my boasting vain about you kind of thing. So he says, but this I say, he that which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now I think this is a really great passage to see what sort of attitude we ought to have when we give. Now let me ask you, if tithing was a New Testament practice, how, how does this verse even make sense? You know, because you know, t the tithe is not something you give, it's something you pay because it belongs to the Lord, right? And uh, you know, when you tithe, you, you give of necessity because you, you are commanded to give the tithe, 10%. So how, how can it be a New Testament practice when Paul is saying here, uh, every man according as he purposeth in his heart? It's almost like you decide how much you give. Whereas the tithe, you're not deciding how much you give. You give 10% of the increase, right? So you see how, tithe, how, how does tithing fit the New Testament model of how we are to give in the New Testament? The New Testament says here, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God loves people that give out of their heart. Now I did just want to touch on verse 6. It says here, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, I think this is a passage that's very dangerous, because obviously this passage can be taken out of context, and people will say, hey, you know what the Bible is teaching here? Hey, if you give all your money, you give all your money to me. Hey, you're going to get more money. You reap, you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. You give 10,000, man, God's going to give you 100,000. I'm sure a lot of people have used it that way, right? But I want to show you tonight that that's not what this passage is teaching. It's not talking about a physical reaping. Because, yeah, if you give money to God, you're not necessarily going to reap physically. You know, you can give thousands and thousands of dollars to God. Hey, where, do you, where are you going to reap? You're going to reap in this world? No, you're going to reap in heaven because right? you're laying up treasures in heaven. So I'm not going to make some promise to you that if you give to this church, hey man, God's going to bless you, your business is going to prosper. No, because that's about reaping what you sow. Like if you work hard, then you're going to make more money. It's not about how much you give to a church or an organization. But what it is teaching here, that if you give physically, I believe you're going to reap 
spiritually. You are laying up treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. And this is actually what it's teaching. Look at it here. It says here, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, He that dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Look at this. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So what does it say? What is it, what is it talking about here? It's saying here, well, if you are willing to give to fulfill the needs of the church, to fulfill the needs of elders, you're going to reap more because now the church is going to be able to do more. You know, like if, if I, just in our situation, like if I have more time, if I don't have to spend 40 hours a week working, don't you think I could do more study? I can meet with you guys, meet with you guys more. People that need help. You know, there are many people that have a lot of questions. You know, I could go and minister to these people and give them more ammo so that when they go and preach, they go into the workforce, now they're going to win more souls. Our church will flourish more because like I'll have more time to do the admin and things like that. This week has been so hectic just because like just the moving and trying to figure out everything with this building. And um, I'm not complaining, you know, it's a blessing to serve the Lord. I just want you guys to realize how much work actually goes in. Elizabeth sees the stress and the work going into just organizing this place and just making sure everything is, is, um, is, is in place, you know. So it's really easy. I remember, you know, when, it was, when I was a, just a church member, oh, it's just so easy just to come along and just sit, you know, and then you complain about things and stuff like that. Well, when you're the one actually having to do it all, it's, it, it's, that's why the more people that help, the, the, it's, it's a real blessing because, you know, even though sometimes I know, like on Sundays, you know, it feels like I'm not really doing much, you know, like I might not be helping clean, I might not be helping pack up. There's a lot of things going on in my mind because I've got to think, you know, what's going to happen next? What's the next thing that's happening? Um, and making sure it all, all goes smoothly. So I try and do a more fa facilitator role. And I know sometimes it might come across as just bossy, you know, just trying to tell people what to do stuff. But, you know, obviously, if, if I have to stack chairs and put them away, somebody else is asking me questions about what I have to do over there. So it's, you know, you're kind of like trying to facilitate everyone and not get bogged down on one thing. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so this is what it's talking about. And, and you know, if we compare this to um, Acts 6. Look at this. This is consistent with what... 2 Corinthians 9 is saying, it says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, look at this, it is not reason, so it's not a reasonable thing that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Um, and I'll just skip. So they chose the, the seven people. Um, and it says here in verse 7, and the word, look at this. This is the result. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we see here that's the purpose of deacons, right? Deacons were there so that the elders could give themselves continually to prayer, to the ministry of the word. And look at what happened. The word of God increased. The fruits of righteousness increased. This is what it's talking about when it says you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. Because if you're not willing to give to an organization to get it running, you're not going to get much from it, right? Because there's going to be nobody to run it. You know, like if we were bigger, we had more, I'd have more time, then you're going to get more from it because I can invest more spiritually into it. And we see here that the deacon's job was to allow the elders to do that and it grows more. So that's, that's the whole idea of sowing bountifully. If you sow bountifully, it frees up the leadership from fishing, right? So that they can fish men. It frees them up from having to go and work for a stationary company, you know? So that, they, you know, so that time can be used. I actually took this week off um, just to, to move and everything like that. And I had to because otherwise Elizabeth would have just been um, bogged down with all the, 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 the moving stuff there. So that, that's what it's talking about. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at 2 Corinthians 9, you know, like if, <laughs> why, why would Paul, you know, 
why, why would he go to the trouble of explaining to them these principles about giving? You know, Paul is taking a lot of time saying, hey, this is how you give, this is what it's for, this is the right mindset to give it, you give every man purpose in his heart, it's cheerful if, t- if it was tithing. Because then, then he would just say what every independent Baptist passes. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in my house. He could just say that. You know, he doesn't have to give all these principles because it's no longer of necessity. It's something we do out of our heart um, to, to the Lord. Uh, um, let's go back here to... Uh, Second Thessalonians three six. <laughs> Paul says here, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but we wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So I, I, I'm bringing up this passage because this is another passage that people will use with 1 Corinthians 9 to say, see, Paul did not take a paycheck. Now, it's, even this passage is not saying that he didn't have the authority to, right? Because verse 9, he says, you know, I didn't want to be chargeable to any of you, verse 8, but verse 9, he says, not because we have not power. So it's not that Paul didn't have the authority to get paid. It's just in this situation, he did it so that he would be an example to them. And, you know, that sometimes I think of my own life. You know, I, I did like to start this church working a job um, because I wanted to show you, hey, somebody can be committed to church and committed to the things of God and still have a job still run a family. You know, that's why I make it a point to, to make sure I'm out soul winning. That's why I make it a point that my wife is out soul winning. You know, even if I have little kids, because I want to be an example to you guys to say, hey, even if you have little kids, even if you have to work a job, we're all busy, but hey, we can all prioritize the things of God. I'm trying to be that example to you. I'm not saying I'm perfect, obviously. I'm not arrived. I'm not saying I'm better than you, but that's my motivation for why I do it. I do it so that, hey, Somebody can't say, oh, you know, I've got little kids, I can't go soul winning. You know, I work a job, I I can't go soul winning. Um, And that's what Paul is saying here. It's not that he doesn't have the power to take a paycheck, but the reason why he did it in this instance with the Thessalonian church is he wanted to show them an example because people in the Thessalonian church were being lazy and he's like, hey, this is how you work hard. This is how you work a paycheck, work for a paycheck and provide for the needs of the church. Um... Now, here it is. I just couldn't remember where it was in my notes. It's all all over the place. So remember when Paul said he didn't use this power, he didn't want to abuse this power in the gospel. Uh, We'll read this passage, and this is why I don't believe Paul is saying that he never, ever got paid by a church. Because look at this. This is 2 Corinthians 11. It's a couple of chapters after 2 Corinthians 9. He says here, so he's referring back, obviously, to when he was... When, the, when he visited the Corinthian church and he didn't take any money from them. He says, Have I committed an offence in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God freely? So he's referring to the fact that he didn't take a paycheck from the Corinthian church. He determined not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified because of the issues that were going on. Look at this, verse 8. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Archaea. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. For what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found, even as we." For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So let me ask you, with 2 Corinthians 11 in mind, 
If we think back to 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul says, I've used none of these things, I didn't want to abuse my power. Is he saying that no church ever paid him? Because in 2 Corinthians 11, he's saying, yeah, I had to rob other churches. Other churches were paying me so I could do youth service. So Paul was taking a paycheck from the saints. He wasn't just working a job. It's just that he had to get provided by other people. But why did he do that? He did that because people were trying to, you know, deny his apostleship. There was all these issues going on, these false prophets. So he made it a point, hey, I didn't want you to think I'm just preaching the gospel to you to get money. So I robbed other churches to do you service. I preached the gospel to you freely because I didn't want anyone. The boasting was not the fact that he wasn't supported. The boasting was the fact that he preached the, to them freely. Like he was, he was really an apostle to them. Not, you know, not that he, he didn't have to take a paycheck. Do you know what I mean? So, so it's not like you boast to say, oh man, you know, if a bishop works a job, he's somehow more noble than somebody who doesn't because they have authority to take a paycheck. It's, it's talking about a boasting, I think a different type of a boasting. And that's why when he says he won't abuse his power in the gospel, I think in the context of what is actually happening in the Corinthian church, he's not saying, if I take a paycheck from you, I'm abusing my power. You know, because obviously, how can it be a, an abuse of power when they that preach the gospel should live off the gospel, you know, like let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So how can he be abusing something that God has ordained? I think it's saying he has this authority as an apostle and he was, he, maybe he was worried that if he took a paycheck, it might actually do that boasting of his office and his, what he was trying to do in Corinth, some damage. You know, it was going to do abuse to that. Not that the power would be abused, but the power would be abused. Does that make sense? So it's not like you, no, you don't abuse the power. Uh, it kind of make, it's kind of like wanted for murder. Like, you know, you can, you can be wanted for murder or you can be to do a murder or um, because you've done a murder. It's like you abuse the power, not because the power is being abused, but the power is being abused in the sense you have power and it's being abused. Does that make sense? <laughs> so with that in mind, you know, he's saying here, it's very obvious he did take wages of them you know and the the fact that he was chargeable to no man in corinth it was people from a church in macedonia came and paid his wages so it wasn't that he was making tents and making his own money he was taking wages of other churches but look what's interesting here and just going back to first timothy 5 remember where he said if any provide not for his own house he's, he's worse than an infidel like we have a responsibility for a church has a responsibility to provide for the needs of those that should be supported by the church it's interesting here that in verse 8, he says, I robbed other churches. Do you know what I mean? Because you, you kind of think, well, wait a second, if a church gives me money, am I robbing them? But, it, but it's almost like he's saying, like, they, they shouldn't be paying my way. You know, like, like a bishop in a church, he shouldn't have to be supported by other churches because the church he's in is meant to be supporting him. Do you know what I mean? And it's almost like, you know, because that church has bishops they're meant to support. And Paul is saying here, I'm robbing their money to, to do you service when you should be, you know, taking care of it. Like, the, the, the church in Corinth should be taking care of Paul. He shouldn't be robbing the wages from elsewhere to do them service. So, just an interesting way in which he's, he's phrased that, uh, or the Holy Ghost has phrased that. Maybe that lines up with 1 Timothy 5. So, he did receive wages. Um, so, this, I, Paul, this, this idea that Paul didn't get paid by a church and only worked a job for his income is just false. You know, like he did. It's just that in that specific instance in Corinth, he didn't want to be chargeable because of the false prophets that were there. In Thessalonians, he worked to give them an example of what it means to work hard. Um, another objection people will say is, uh, you know, only, and I sort of alluded to this already, only evangelists should be supported and everyone else should work a job and they say well you know if you're a bishop in one place you don't get support it's only if you're traveling then you have a need because you can't sort of settle and work for yourself you know it's, what's interesting about that is let me show you here you know you know the word evangelist only appears three times in the bible you know twice it's evangelist in the singular one it's evangelist in the plural um, and here it just says here that evangelists are given to the church and he says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So you can't really glean from this passage what an evangelist is, right? Because it's just saying it's giving evangelists, it's giving pastors, it's giving teachers. See, because I think the bishop is the office, but a bishop can fulfill some of these roles. Like sometimes the bishop, like in some instances, was the apostle. Sometimes they were a prophet. Sometimes they were a, a, 
a pastor. They shepherded a flock. Other times they just taught. You know, maybe they didn't actually pastor people, but they taught. Um, and and uh, other times they would evangelize. You know, they'd bring the gospel. They'd go and preach. Um, so these are just things that people do. And, and anybody can take up even the last three, right? Anyone, even if you're not an elder, you may still have people that you lead, right? Like people that follow you. Everyone sets an example in the church. You may have younger people that look to you as a leader, even though you're not technically a bishop in that church. That's why it's very important, our example in the church and how we behave, because the younger children, they will look up to you. You know, the younger children might look up to younger people like Alex and Ashton, but then they see like people like me and the older people, oh, you know, like the, you know, children are like that. They, they tend to sort of gravitate towards people that are a bit younger, but they see their parents as like, oh, you know, that's just my parents. Um, so it's very important, the example that we set. So, you know, people within the church, they can be a You know, when we go soul winning, we're evangelists. You know, like you may have people that you're helping to lead and shepherd and even feed, you know, not necessarily in a sermon, but you might be, you know, telling people, hey, you know, this is what the Bible says. You're feeding them, you know, like a, like a shepherd feeds the flock. And you might be teaching people something. You might teach them some practical skills, like the older women teach the younger women. You might teach them how to cook and how to clean, how to take care of children, how to diaper them or whatever. So these are not offices within the church. These are just certain tasks, I think, that people do. And everyone comes together and talks about all the, the body coming together and edifying one another. Uh, Look at here. This is 2 Timothy 4. This one. This is the second time evangelist is used in the Bible. It says here, but watch thou in all things. Now, now notice this is written to Timothy, right? Timothy is, is a bishop. Um, it says here, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So the second, second time evangelist is used, it's not some traveling guy. He's, he's talking to a bishop to say, hey, you do the work of an evangelist, right? But there's one, one person in the Bible that's actually called an evangelist. Do you know who it is? Oops, that's the wrong passage. Um. And the next day, we that are of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. We entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now, what was Philip? Philip was a deacon in, in the early church. But, what, but what's funny is they say this evangelist is this traveling person, and the only person that's called an evangelist in the Bible is Philip. And where is he? He's in his home. He's in his house with his daughters. So he's obviously not on the move. He's at his home. He's living somewhere. He owns a house. Do you know what I mean? So this idea that this evangelist is this traveling guy that preaches one message at, at 500 churches... You know, that, that's, that's not an evangelist. That's just some guy that's figured out a way to make money preaching one message to tons of people. You know, so an evangelist is just somebody that brings the gospel. And it's funny that the only people that are described in the Bible as evangelists is a deacon and Timothy is a bishop told to do the work of an evangelist. Make sure they're doing it. So, you know, is evangelist an office? I don't think so. You know, and um, I just want to make a brief comment here about, you know, you know Garrett Kirchway, where he's going to Botswana to be an evangelist. To me, you know, I'll su we'll support the guy. You know, as, as, as long as I'm working, I think we'll support him because even though I don't necessarily agree with the method, I, I, you know, I know him. He's a great soul winner. I know he's going to win many people in Botswana. And, you know, what other worthy cause is there to give and support? So, you know, we're going to support him. But I will say this. I don't think it's biblical. You know, because like I said, there's only three offices, three positions in the church I think that should be paid. And that's if you're a widow, if you're a bishop or a deacon. There's not this office of an evangelist, you know, because the evangelists in the Bible we saw, they're bishop and a deacon. Um, you see, and a bishop and a deacon, there are qualifications to be a bishop and a deacon. You have to be the husband of one wife. You have to have children not accused right or unruly. You have to have children. Um, and I just think Garrett, Garrett doesn't have children. He's not even married yet. So... You know, why is he, you know, being sent over to basically be, you know, not in name the bishop of that church, but in practicality he will be, you know, because he's going to be the one teaching week in and week out, because it's not going to be Stephen Anderson that goes there every week to preach. It's going to be Garrett. So, you know, even though the, the way they're running it is they're saying, well, it's not going to be an independent church, it's just a ministry of, um, of faithful word. 
I think in practicality, it's like if, it's a, if it quacks like a duck and it's a duck, it's, it's a duck, right? Stephen Anderson says that all the time. So, it's, it, you know, if you're going to set up a group overseas, I mean, that's a church. Do you know what I mean? You're just not calling it a church. So to me, it's, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that across, like, like we wouldn't do that across, you know, across Sydney, right? Set up another group, set up somebody who's not qualified to lead that group. So is it okay if it's across country now? So if it's a different country, it's okay. But if it's the same country, it's not okay. That's condemned because, oh, you know, you don't, you know, you don't just start church. It's not a real church because it's not, you know, whatever. But see, I wouldn't even do that. Like, for me, I think it's not wise that churches set up all these satellite Bible studies and put people in charge that are not qualified. You know, that's, that's, that's not ideal. It's not ideal for a church to not have a bishop and when you set up a Bible study, you can call it a Bible study, but that's a, that's, that's a little church that you've set up, and you just put somebody in charge that's not qualified. Um, so I think ideally, you know, he, you know, if it was a perfect situation, I'd say he'd go there, if he really wanted to reach Botswana, go there, you know, get married, find a job, join an existing church there and help them to grow, and then when he's qualified, then be ordained and start that church. But... Um, yeah, to me, it's just, you know, I, I would support it, but to me, it's, um, it's not necessarily a, a biblical thing. So, now the last passage I want to go to is John 10, verse 7. So I think you can see here very clearly, you know, the Bible clearly teaches <coughs> bishops, you know, church has a responsibility to take care of the needs of the bishops and deacons and widows. Um, we see here that Paul is not a good example for bishops not getting paid because he wasn't a bishop and plus he did get paid. You know, he, he didn't just work a job. Um, the last thing really that they try to use to um, falsely accuse bishops is this passage in John 10. In John 10 it says here in verse 7, Then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and, am, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd." So one thing I've often heard said from the house church movement is, uh, if, your, if your bishop gets paid, they're just a hireling. You know, they're just doing it for the money, and they're just, you know, they're just in it for the money, and they're no different to the hireling that's in John 10. Now, to me, that's, that's a really false accusation. And, and you know, just because somebody gets paid doesn't mean their primary motive is the money. But even so, you know, when we looked over all the passages that we've gone through tonight, I mean, the Bible teaches that they can get paid. So how does that make them a higher? How do we then understand what is being taught here? Um, now, you know, the word hireling appears nine times in the Bible, you know, and, and it appears in eight different verses. And it's not always used negatively. You know, I'll show you just two examples. But in Job 7, so the word hireling is not in and of itself negative. A hireling is just somebody that gets paid to do a job. You know, it's, all, it's just like employee you know it's, we were talking yesterday at alex's house about curse words and we we're saying like you know, why does one word sound worse than another and we we're saying the you know the, the four letter s word it sounds really bad but if you say like poo for example that, that that you know that's fine that's not a swear word you know it's kind of like this it's like hireling has this negative connotation because that's how people use it oh, he's a hireling he's just in it for the money and this is how it's being used in john 10. But that doesn't mean the word hireling is always a negative word because it's used other times in the Bible and it's not always used negatively. Look at what it says here. It says, Is there not an appointed time to man unto earth, upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of an hireling? As a servant earnestly desire the shadow, and as an hireling looketh for the reward of his work. 
So he's just saying here, like, hey, like our days on earth, because this is Job, and he's like going through all these trials, and he's saying like, you know, man upon the earth, it's like we're looking for the end. Like Michael's always saying, he wants to go home full health and full strength. You know, we're looking for the heavenly home. We're a sojourner here. This is what he's saying. He's just like we look to leave this world. We look for the, like the servant. He looks for the shadow of the tree when, he, when his work is finished. The same like a hireling. A hireling is like he's done the work and now he's looking for the reward of his work. Because you know, he's did a, done a job, he, he wants to get paid. Um, look here in uh, Malachi 3.5. He says, and I will come near to you to judgment. I will be swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. So God here is angry. He's judging, saying, you know, against the sorcerer, against the adulterer, and he's saying, and those that oppress the hireling from his wages. Which means the hireling deserves wages. It's fine for him to receive wages. And the wrong is when you don't give him the wages that he deserves. So what then is John 10 talking about? So with that in mind, let's consider John 10. So what is wrong with this hireling? Because a hireling is not wrong in and of itself. So what's the problem with this hireling? Well, let's have a look. Verse 12. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. So what's this hireling like? When the wolf comes, where is he? He's gone. So what is that in the context of a church? When times are hard, bishop's gone. You know, church is struggling, you know, they go to another church where the, the ministries are flourishing, and they can get a paycheck. They're not they're willing to work the hard yards with the people they have, and, and, and make it work. Um, you know, times are, times are rough, right? So let's say our church comes under persecution. What if I just flee, took the money and flee to another country? That's the sort of hireling that John 10 is talking about. He's not just saying to anyone that gets paid. The problem with this hireling is when times get tough, the hireling's gone. He flees and the wolf comes in, Satan comes in, devours up the flock. There's not a flock here anymore. And we see that where, you know, bishops under the call of God. They go somewhere else, and what happens to the church that's left? I mean, Punchbowl Baptist Church is an example of that, where they, you know, they, they don't have, like, a necessarily one bishop. And there are other churches that we know of that don't have a bishop, and what happens to those churches? They start bickering amongst each other because there's no leadership anymore. They're fighting over the money, and eventually that church just fizzles out. They become useless. Um, not always the case, but, you know, it's not ideal, but we see that happening. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling. Now, does it end there? No, he's not just fleeing because he gets paid. He's saying, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling, and look at this, and careth not for the sheep. So it's not just that he's getting paid. It's when times get tough, he's gone. And, you know, he doesn't care about the people. You know, like, and that's why, you know, it always, it always bugged me in churches where you couldn't get a hold of the bishop. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you know, it's like after, after, the, after church, they're like the first ones out the door. You know, it's like, you know, I, you know, I don't want to name names, but, you know, it just, it just bugs me that, you know, sometimes like in the, in, you know, in the closing prayer, have you ever seen that? Where it's like in the closing prayer of the church meeting, you open your eyes, the bishop's like gone. Right, they're gone because they're out with their buddies. They got to take them out for, to dinner, to lunch. And it's like, what about the flock? You know, like they spend more time with their missionary buddies than they do with their own flock. This is the problem with the hireling. They don't care about the sheep. They don't want to get to know their sheep. This is what it needs to be different about bishops. They need to care about their people. They want to spend, they want to get to know them, spend time with them, um, things like that. So that's the problem with this hiring. He doesn't care for the sheep. Um, when times are hard. He's gone. And what is Jesus teaching in this passage? I end on this point. What's Jesus teaching here? He's comparing himself to the hireling. He's saying he is the good shepherd. He is not this type of hireling. Right? Because Jesus does care for the sheep. You know, casting all your care upon him because he careth for you. you know, Jesus is the good shepherd. He gives his life for the sheep. You know, greater love hath no man than this. And a man lay down his life for his friends. And he does, you know, he does care about the sheep. And when times get hard, you know, he's not going to leave you. Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, in the world you have tribulation. 
be of good comfort. I have overcome the world. So that's what Jesus is teaching in this passage. He's not saying there's wrong that somebody gets paid. He's just saying, hey, compared to him, he's the good shepherd. And compared to a hireling that flees when the wolf comes, doesn't care about the sheep, just in it for the money, he's saying, that's not me. You know, he's a good shepherd. Praise God for that.